everybody and uh, welcome to this uh, Purchasing Insight webinar on preparing for the new payment practice and performance reporting uh, legislation. Um, we're still seeing uh, a few people uh, still joining, uh, so I'll hold off just for a second so that people can get themselves comfortable. Okay, let's um, let's get let's get started. The um, many of you will already be aware of the, the the new legislation, which is actually an amendment to existing legislation that requires some businesses in the UK or with a connection to the UK to uh, to report on the payment policies and practices and performance. And for many organisations, urgent action is required not just to get prepared for the, the new reporting requirement it, itself but also perhaps to put their house in order so that when they do report they uh, they show themselves in a, in a good light this webinar is uh, aimed at explaining exactly what the new reporting requirements are who's affected and what needs to be reported and also to describe some ways that businesses can help get their house in order um, by potentially uh, improving their purchase to pay processes. So in terms of an agenda, uh, we'll be looking at something like a, a 40 minute session. I know that you're all very busy. Um, I'm going to uh, run through a, a short session on how to prepare for the reporting uh, requirements. I'm then going to hand over to Fabrizio Falzerano from Canon, who's going to share some uh, insights in how P2P automation can help compliance. And then we'll finish with some, uh, some questions and answers. So I guess the first question I'd like to address is, is why, why is all of this important? And I think there's a number of reasons why this is important. First and foremost, this is mandatory. There's no way of getting out of this. Um, all larger companies, medium and uh, large companies, uh, as well as limited liability partnerships, are obliged to report both their payment policies and their actual um, practice or performance uh, twice a year. Failure to do so is, will actually be a criminal uh, offence and all directors and partners of affected companies will be personally liable. So this is, a, this is a big deal and a serious issue. Secondly, poor practice and poor performance is actually very common. Um, over recent years it's become increasingly common for businesses to extend payment terms to their suppliers as a means of uh, better managing cash flow. In, in many cases this is completely legitimate practice and accepted in, in many industries. But the new rules will make this very much more transparent and one can't be completely sure how um, extended payment terms will be interpreted by, by many. Thirdly, late payment um, damages supply chains. Um, suppliers have cash flow needs too. It's not just the, the, the buyers that want to manage their uh, cash flow better. And by extending payment terms or by failing to, to meet agreed payment terms, that has a knock-on effect to suppliers and a cost that can, um, that can come back to buyers either in the form of increased prices or by suppliers choosing to go elsewhere were and in fact we've seen we've seen this in recent years in the UK in the retail industry 
where suppliers to, to, to some retailers have deliberately refused to supply to some, some retailers who have a reputation for poor payments, preferring instead to sign up exclusive contracts with retailers with a reputation for, for fairer treatment. Fourthly, poor performance will be coming to the public domain. This new legislation will really shine a spotlight on any company that pays uh, suppliers in an unfair way. It will also shine a light on companies that treat suppliers very fairly and have a reputation for paying promptly. But in, in actual fact, most late payments are as a result of, um, of poor process and inefficiency. It's not intentional and it doesn't, it won't look good um, or it's, it won't be good to be seen to be in any way incompetent. Finally, it's an opportunity uh, to, to reduce costs. Um, this is mandatory, but um, despite the fact that there's some, there's been some poor press about um, well, about uh, companies seeing it as an unnecessary uh, an unnecessary burden, it is actually an opportunity to create efficiencies uh, by improving processes. So, who needs to report? Which businesses will be affected? And like I say, large and medium-sized companies and limited liability partnerships will be affected. Uh, but what does that mean? And it's defined in the legislation that um, large and medium-sized companies um, have to fulfil two of three criteria. Um, having turnover in excess of £36 million per annum, having £18 million on the balance sheet, or having greater than 250 employees. So th this is certainly not small companies that will be affected, um, which I think is a good thing because it is, um, there is extra administration, but larger companies absolutely should know most of the information that they need to report in any case. Secondly, this relates just to qualifying contracts. So well, what, what does a qualifying contract mean? Um, qualifying contracts that need to be reported upon are contracts that are, first of all, between two or more businesses, which is a fairly standard component of a contract. They need to have a connection to the UK. It covers all goods and services and intangibles, things like intellectual property where no tangible product or service changes hands. And financial, uh, financial services are, are excluded. Apologies for the typo that I've just spotted. Um, what that means, for example, is that most of the business that a bank conducts um, won't need to be reported upon. However, the non-financial services uh, aspects of their the business, things like the supply of office stationery and, and so on, those contracts uh, are reportable. And new businesses uh, don't need to report in their first financial year. Well, what exactly needs to be reported? Um, first of all, um, in terms of payment practice, details of standard payment terms um, need, need to be reported and published. The contractual length of time for payment needs to be specified. And if that's different, depending on the type of contract or the type of supplier, those differences need to be specified. If some suppliers or some contracts payment is made in 30 days or the 60 days, that needs to be described. The maximum contract payment period needs to be reported. So if, for example, most suppliers are paid in 30 days, but some suppliers are paid in 120 days, even if it's just one, that needs to be reported. And also details of any changes made to payment terms during the reporting period. The requirements are much more uh, detailed than this, of course. Um, some of the detail behind 
um, this particular aspect. Um, the, the report needs to include details of whether suppliers were consulted before changes were made and things like that. In terms of payment performance, and remember payment performance is what actually happens rather than what the, the policy is. Businesses need to report the average actual payment performance, so what they actually achieved. If they intend to pay in 30 days all of the time, but sometimes they miss, they have to report that. They need to specify payments that are made, actually made within 30 days, within 60 days, and longer than 60 days. And I think this is quite an interesting aspect to the legislation because I think it reveals the spirit of the legislation, which is, in my view, is saying the government sees no issue with 30 and 60 day terms, but terms longer than that, it may have an issue with. Um, and businesses need also to report the percentage of payments made outside of uh, agreed terms. There are some other th interesting things that need to be reported. Um, it's required to specify whether electronic invoices are offered. I think this is very interesting and it alludes to a recognition uh, from the government that electronic invoices reflect efficient processes. And I think it's, it's uh, actually an opportunity for businesses that do use electronic invoices to um, wave a flag and advertise the fact. Similarly, if supply chain finance is available to suppliers. So for example, if suppliers are paid early um, in exchange for a discount, arrangements like that, again, it's an opportunity to wave a flag and um, advertise good and innovative practice. Whether charges are made to suppliers for remaining on preferred supplier lists, this, I think this is quite key. Um, it, many would see that as being unfair practice, um, no less uh, unfair than, than paying late. Whether um, businesses are members of a payment code, and also details of the process for resolving disputes. I mean, disputes happen, there are mismatches between invoices and purchase orders, and there should be a, um, a process in place, and the requirement is um, to, to publish a narrative description of, of what that, that process is. What are the deadlines? When is the reporting required? Well, the reporting is required twice a year. Uh, one report um, is re the first report is required within 30 days after the first six months of a business's financial year. The second report uh, is due 30 days, uh, within 30 days of the end of the financial year. Businesses need to start to report effectively six months from um, the start of the financial year. So the legislation comes into effect on the 6th of April. Um, if a company's uh, financial year starts in uh, May, for example, in month five, then they need to report in November, that's six months later. And the next report is due the following May. Um, what are the implications of this? Well, if any business thinks they've got, um, who has a financial year starting in May and they think they've got till November, to, to worry about this, that they're, they're mistaken. You've got to remember the report may not be required until six months after the start of the financial year. However, that report needs to describe what actually happened from the beginning of the financial year. So if there's a need to get um, a house in order, um, take any remedial action, that the thinking about that really needs to start immediately. We don't know for sure, but it could be the consequences of, um, of, of re reporting poor performance could be, could be inordinate, as I, as I said. And, and what's important is that the consequences of, of late reporting or inaccurate reporting um, is, is very serious. It's a criminal offence and directors and partners will be personally liable for that. So how should uh, companies prepare? 
My first question, is it okay to do nothing apart from report? Well, I would say that any company that always pays to terms, that always pays promptly and never extends uh, payment terms to manage cash flow, and at the same time can always resolve payment problems quickly, they need, need not worry. All they need to do is report on that very good uh, performance. But very few companies fit into this category. So it's not okay simply to report. It's very important to examine current practices and performance and see what can be done to improve. Remember the consequences of public uh, reporting. There are some positive consequences. It's an opportunity for businesses to publish quite publicly that they're good performers. And I would be personally willing to bet that there are some newspapers in the UK that will have um, a field day when these, some of these figures are, are published. And they will highlight the, the, the best companies in the UK and they'll also highlight the worst companies in the UK. It also potentially, uh, poor performance could take the edge off supplier negotiations. If a supplier knows that um, a customer has a reputation for poor performance, they could choose to walk away from an opportunity or use that as a negotiating lever. Some customers, and certainly in public sector, um, prefer to deal with businesses that treat suppliers fairly, and now they have a way of seeing what the, uh, the actual performance will be. And again, it's difficult to predict, but reputational damage caused by publishing poor performance could have an inordinate effect. And by that I mean that the benefits of paying late and managing cash flow could be completely offset by the reputational damage of, of seeing uh, poor performance published. So how can purchase to pay help? Uh, poor payment performance is um, usually as a direct result of poor purchase to pay practice. Certainly in my experience that there's an element of intentional late payment sometimes, but most late payment is through poor purchase to pay practice. If, for example, purchase orders aren't used universally, it's very difficult to approve invoices leading to late payment. And similarly, if, if records of receipt aren't kept, it can be impossible to know if an invoice really should be paid. So specifically, what can be done? And I think that there are five headline actions that businesses can take now to, to, to improve performance. Firstly, use purchase orders. It may seem obvious. and You may think that large companies always do this. This is simply not the case. Um, purchase orders aren't just a means of communicating something to suppliers. They're a really important control to, to allow a three-way match and allow invoices to be paid promptly. Take approvals very seriously. Make sure that POs are always a, a approved before being sent to suppliers. This isn't just about um, uh, mitigating against the risk of, of fraud and uh, misuse of company funds. Again, it's, it's an important control that uh, allows accounts payable people to pay invoices promptly. Thirdly, receipts, keeping strict records of receipting and having good practice in terms of receipts. Again, you would think that all big, uh, big businesses would uh, have this sorted, but it simply isn't the case. Um, good record keeping helps resolve disputes quickly and again allows invoices to be paid on time. Technology, 15 or 20 years ago, it, it would cost a small fortune to put purchase to pay technology in place. But uh, there, there's a range of options now um, and the, the, the cost of, of good practice is much lower than it used to be. Um, and there's no doubt about it that in the 21st century technology plays a, a hugely important role in back office process efficiency. Um, finally, no PO, no pay. Um, no PO, no pay can be a good thing, a good message to suppliers. Get suppliers involved. When you've got good practices, it makes sense to let suppliers know that you'll only pay when there are purchase orders in place, and it gives suppliers reassurance that if, if they take part in a good practice too, 
then uh, they know that their invoices can be uh, will be paid promptly. I'm going to hand over to uh, Fabrizio now, who's going to look at how P2P automation can help uh, with compliance. Thank you very much, Pete, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so my name is uh, Fabrizio Falzarano. Just very quickly to introduce myself, I'm part of Canon, and I look after uh, our solutions in the area of finance and procurement automation. Uh, so I've been in this business for more than five years, I would say now developing uh, these propositions. So I would like to share with you my thoughts on this call and I hope to be um, helpful to you. So the first thing really uh, that I wanted to talk to you about is uh, connected to some of the points that Pete was talking about is the reason why uh, this legislation is out there. Um, you see here, um, there is a recent research from Bax uh, from December. Uh, which uh, gives out the number of overdue payments, and that's uh, standing at uh, 26.3 billion uh, for SMEs. Uh, so on average, uh, late payment debt is at 32K, um, and uh, you see that 42% of uh, me small and medium companies basically uh, spend up to four hours a week chasing late payments. So that's the main reason why the government is acting in this area. And you see, you know, there is a quote on the right side from the, uh, the Minister for Small Business, which is really um, pointing out the fact that larger businesses have a key role in uh, reducing the number there by bringing be best practices and by using best practices in the way they pay. So I'm going to say uh, a few words here on why late payments. And I think this is something quite obvious uh, for, for most of you also. Um, I'm not saying anything new, I think. But in the context particularly of accounts payable, uh, the main topic is around invoice flow control. Um, it, and Pete was also referring to this. It's very difficult to tell where invoices are in the process if you have manual process. Um, you know, invoices in paper sitting on a desk for many days, so you have time that is lost in that case. <clears throat> and the other important point is around the visibility of payment, generally speaking. This is something very difficult because um, if you don't have, if you're using your ERP, your finance system, it's very difficult that you will be able to have technology to support you in terms of seeing, you know, how you are performing versus those deadlines. And uh, you have a challenge, therefore, in terms of being uh, able to see if you are, uh, you know, how you're managing your cash. It's, this is usually a, a challenge. And the third point is, of course, related to the accuracy of those payments when the process is manual, um, the errors uh, happen, and, um, you know, you, you have to, you, you pay uh, basically uh, maybe the wrong way, and then you have to spend time going back and they, you lose time basically, and uh, it's one of the issues that is driving also those late payments sometimes. Overall, it's about slow processing, so uh, obviously uh, it, it's all connected, and uh, particularly mid sized organizations, which is the core target, I would say, uh, for this legislation, when you look into what, what kind of companies is, is targeting. Uh, that's uh, something that is happening still very much today. We talk to a lot, a lot of companies that are still uh, processing uh, invoices manually, and that's um, basically bringing the payments as well. Uh, you know, in our in our view, um, from the perspective of Canon, uh, and here I'm, I'm going to start, let's say, giving a bit of uh, um, advice or views on how we see, you know, the opportunity for change, if you like, and we really advocate the, um, let's say, the ability to uh, put in place and use a solution that is building on top of your capabilities uh, within your finance system, within your ERP. And generally speaking, an end-to-end -end procurement to pay solution is a solution that, um, you know, it's uh, flexible and so it's designed according to your requirement. But generally speaking, it's one platform. It's one platform that covers the entire procurement to pay process uh, and uh, allows you to move basically from budgeting to electronic requisitions to the receival of the, um, of the, of the goods and service the matching of the invoices, the approval of those invoices, and then the posting. 
and finally, uh, most importantly, you know, for legislation purposes, is the uh, um, the archival uh, of uh, of the invoices and the transactions. Everything managed digitally, and everything managed um, uh, on a platform that allows you to basically work with data and not with invoices, which is really what you want to do at the end of the day in order to be. Um, to be practicing, uh, let's say, uh, best practices in this area to be able to perform. Um, you see that um, there is a line uh, across the whole process which is around uh, reporting and analytics. Once you have those data points coming through uh, your uh, uh, solution, um, then you can uh, do smart things with this information. And it's very much uh, a, a, really a, a click of a button to allow you to then uh, create reports, to allow you to have uh, analytics uh, on the way you are performing, and then eventually to report uh, to the regulator as uh, you are not supposed to do. So. To put it into practice, I've just um, taken out a few screenshots from um, some elements of, of the solution we, we offer, which I think are relevant. For example, what you see here is um, a dashboard around uh, uh, procurement to pay, and it's a typical view that a finance uh, director and accounts payable manager will be able to see. Um, once you have those data coming through the system, it's very easy to really uh, keep track of, uh, for example, the processing time in days, um, the credit period, the payment variance, and it's very easy to uh, be able to really look into each supplier and be able to see, you know, what's your average and what's the, what is the time that you are spending to approve invoices for a specific supplier. And this is a, a live. It's live data. You don't have to compile data from multiple sources as it is often the case when you are working with data on the back of your ERP or your finance system. This is another example. Uh, one of the things you have to report on, as we have heard from Pete, is um, whether you're using electronic invoices. And uh, what you see here is an example of a dashboard around that, where you can clearly uh, see the amount of paper, of scanned invoices, versus electronic invoicing. And this is, of course, also important for you in order to you know, move your organization uh, more toward electronic invoicing because that's what you want eventually. You want to be, um, you, know, you want to get rid of, of paper really at the end of the day. Uh, but this is an example of, uh, of some of the dashboard. And then really, uh, I, mm, this is the last slide I have around uh, the reports. Uh, this is an example of a report. You can create a lot of reports through a purchase to pay automation uh, solution. In this case, you see here uh, the invoice processing days. It's a report that is showing, I've hidden the name of the vendors, but uh, um, uh, you can uh, see that for each vendor, uh, you can automatically see how much is on, uh, so the total pay amount per supplier. You can see the number of invoices that have been handled um, for that supplier. You can see how many people are currently reviewing those invoices. And then most importantly, you can see how much time is taking for you uh, on average to approve uh, the invoices. And this is critical information, as you can uh, imagine, when, when you have to um, be in control of the process, uh, it allows you to really have these uh, red signals um, flagged if uh, you see that, for example, uh, there is, like in the case I've already here, there are, there are 73 invoices um, being managed for the supplier with quite a, a high va uh, value. You know, you want to take a look into that to make sure that you are in control. And this is really what uh, P2P automation is giving you at the end of the day. Uh, we have just brought in an example here of a company uh, which fits very nicely this, uh, um, let's say, this mid-size uh, organizations and the requirement of the re uh, regulation is called Q Electrical. We uh, have worked with them recently. Q Electrical is a is an electronic um, a able set of electronic components. Um, they were manually processing 96,000 invoices for 24 UK stores uh, every year. And this company is meeting two out of the three uh, payment reporting requirements. So it's a good case. Uh, and it's a typical example of uh, companies we work with. Uh, they had a laborious and complex process. And again, it was a manual uh, way of working. 
matching paper invoices, with delivering notes on paper, with, with purchase order. Uh, there was an, a, a good visibility on the payment status, um, a lot of time spent by accounts payable teams uh, causing delays in payment and uh, you know I'm happy to say that now we're actually having conversation with them on how they can make the best of the technology they have also in terms of reporting because for them now it's very easy to they've not just improve the process of course um, but they, it's now easier for them to show that they are compliant uh, so um, uh, yeah it's, it's a success story for us and uh, um, I just wanted to bring that to you on this call so really this is my last slide to summarize some of the messages I've been given um, I wanted to uh, share with you what I think are the four reasons for change what are the, the more important points and on adopting procurement to pay automation uh, to bring you to be, allow you to be compliant the first one is visibility so again for me the message is um, you need to be able to work with data and not with invoices so I will ask I would like to ask yourself you know, you know are you able to do that today and how easy it is for you to do that today and, and so uh, P2P automation can help you in that area and the second part is about uh, control and it's about uh, uh, the ability to monitor the process. And again, uh, this is something you achieve um, through uh, procurement to pay automation um, to stay in control of those payment terms, those payment deadlines. And obviously, of course, compliance. Uh, this is about uh, the external compliance now with the regulation, but also is internal compliance because you uh, are more in control, you allow people to really follow the, uh, the best practices and um, both in a conspiracy but also in procurement. You know, who is buying what, uh, you are in control of market expenders and so on. And finally, I've not talked about this point uh, today because it's probably less relevant for this uh, webinar, but really we work with companies because they want to be more efficient as a starting point. They want to reduce costs. And the ROI is perhaps clearer and more visible when we are um, talking about uh, the reduction of, of costs in, in payment transactions, in the amount of time spent uh, and people involved. Uh, but really, it's one of the, of the reasons for change. I think the other three are, are uh, very important too. Sometimes we pay less attention, let's say, to those. That's uh, all from my side. Uh, so just thank you, not for me, and uh, really uh, to say that uh, we, uh, you know, if you want to continue this conversation with us, there will be definitely an opportunity. I think we will be sending out some feedback form after um, we can do, uh, you know, process audits or or business qualification if needed. Uh, I think I have just another quote here from the uh, small business minister to again highlight the importance of the, the whole topic we're discussing today. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thanks, uh, Fabrizio. Um, we're running a little bit out of time, so I want to move straight on to um, some questions. We, we've had a number of questions, and I, I don't think we'll have the opportunity to go through all of them, but we'll get through uh, as many as we can. One question of interest. Um, what does it mean to have a UK connection? In a car? I think this is in relation to the, the the definition of a qualifying contract, so businesses only have to report on um, on, on relevant business, and re relevant means qualifying contracts. And one of the criteria for that is having a UK connection. Um, the the details of what that means um, are described in a document uh, issued by the Department of for, for business, energy, and industrial strategy, uh, it goes into great detail. But uh, essentially, it, let's say, for example, you have a global uh, a global organisation, and it could be headquartered in the United States, but it has a subsidiary in the UK. Um, the certainly the UK subsidiary would be required to report uh, on the payment performance, but the global organization itself would not. Similarly, you might have a company that's based in the UK or is known to be a UK company, but it could do some business entirely outside of the UK. And even if um, that the contract 
is uh, written under UK law, if it's entirely outside of the UK and there's no real connection, then there's no obligation uh, to report. Um, th there are lots of complicated scenarios that you could, you could uh, envisage and it would be difficult to, to, to cover all of them. Um, but um, we will send a link to that document from the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. It's called the Duty to Report on Payment Practices and Performance. Send a link out together with a recording of this session and also um, written answers uh, to the questions that we don't uh, manage to cover. Now, actually, Fabrizio, there's another question that I think is for you. Um, this question, is the solution that you um, you showed, is that able to monitor payment terms versus an invoice? Okay, uh, yeah, this is a more of a, it's a technical question. Um, it is. So the way it works, uh, I show on, that, uh, on the slide um, where you have basically the P2P system sitting on top of your ERP and uh, basically uh, through any, any integration, uh, light integration and exchange of data between the ERP and the solution, you will be able to also basically get these, uh, uh, well, the payment terms from the ERP and these payment terms are then applied to each supplier in the P2P solution. So that basically, uh, as soon as the invoice arrives, then you're able to, um, the system uh, will calculate for you, uh, you know, the, the uh, the cash required and the, the payment date is, is highlighted uh, based on the on the trading terms. So that's yes, yeah. that's something that will happen. Yeah. Oh, okay, thanks for that. Um, probably time for one more question. This intrigues me actually. Um, the question is: Can AP outsourcing help with uh, help with reporting? And yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued by that because of course. Um, Lots of businesses outsource AP to, um, to, to third parties. Um, and I guess when those contracts were written, that could well have been before these reporting requirements were, um, were, were published. So it could be a change to, to, to practice. Well, what, have you got any views on mm -hmm. that? I mean, on this point, we this is a, a, an interesting topic. So the whole uh, area of outsourcing, you know, around, around accounts payable is uh, is evolving uh, very quickly. And and uh, from an outsourcing perspective, you're also seeing uh, providers like us as well, you know, trying to bring more value. So um, you will see, I think, more and more um, providers that are able to um, bring to market also value add around this area, around uh, the reporting. But the bottom line to me is. I think is the, one of the key points is the fact that you, you will anyway need the procurement to pay automation technology to help you. And very often, this is what we actually do in, in, in the market. We have hybrid solution where you have um, you work with a supplier where, that is able to, to have a hybrid solution. So partly outsourcing your process, partly allowing you to use a platform, uh, maybe it's cloud-based, uh, so that basically the process is shared, the two responsibilities are shared, and then it's up to you to decide whether you want to, re you know, create those reports I show a little on yourself, or whether you want to have the source provider to do that for you. But it's definitely a discussion. I would say that uh, uh, is important to have in, in, if you are already using an outsourcing provider, or if you want to work with a with a company. In in our case in Canon, we we are very flexible on that, so okay. we have different models of outsourcing or uh, or managed service. Oh, thanks. thanks for that. We've just got just less than a, a minute left, so I won't uh, address any more questions and, and rather just um, round up and summarise. First of all, thank you all for your attendance. We had a good attendance uh, for, the, for this event and some good questions. Um, just to confirm, we will send um, a, a link to the, a recording of this session. We'll also send uh, a copy of the, the slides and also a report that we, we published um, a, a few weeks ago which goes into a, a little bit more detail um, as well as the link to the to, to the government guidance on that. So um, finished bang on time, thanks for that Fabrizio. Thank you, and, thank you everybody. Uh, and um, I look forward to seeing you uh, at another Purchasing Insight webinar in the future. Thank you.